It's good to see you this morning. The uh, the lights earlier, the it was red or it was green, yellow, red, and I chose that this week to signify our transition from Genesis two to Genesis three, because we're kind of moving from green to red, <laughs> in, in in a theological sense, and. Um, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm kind of amazed that I'm standing up here right now. I've preached a lot of sermons, but never on a week when I was moving as well. <clears throat> and so you can imagine that my body is exhausted, but I'm still God. He just comes along and he sustains you and he gives you what you need for what he has set before you. And so I'm still very excited and delighted to be bringing the message from Genesis chapter 3 this morning. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news. But that is what I'm going to be for two weeks. Has anyone ever asked you if you prefer the bad news or the good news first? What do you usually say? Wow. Would anybody say that they prefer the good news first? Todd, we got a couple? Okay. I, I, I can understand either preference, really. But when it comes to the good news of Jesus Christ, you need the bad news first. Because the good news of the gospel doesn't make sense without the bad news. If you ran up to somebody on the street and said, Hey, I've got something that'll save your life. Their first reaction would be, Save my life from what? And that really is the question, isn't it? Save us from what? And that's where Genesis 3 comes to give us the answers to that. Genesis 3 provides humanity with the setup of the gospel. Stories always have an antagonist, right? Some sort of villain to set the plot. We like happy endings, but the storylines never go happy beginning, happy middle, happy end, do they? I mean, I don't think, has anybody ever went and watched a movie that was just about a family getting along? You know, how was the movie? It was good. What was it about? Oh, just people just getting along with each other. <laughs> I guess it wasn't a true story then, huh? But Genesis 1 ended with God seeing all that he had made and declaring it very good. And Genesis 2 ended with Adam and Eve being naked in the garden and unashamed. But it's like at the last verse of Genesis 2, you see the scene, right? Uh, you, and, and it just pauses. The scene freezes and it's happy and, and it's green and, and uh, there's these wonderful blue skies and, and the, the musical score is like babbling brook and birds chirping and Adam and Eve are just smiling and the scene just pauses on that and it freezes, and then the music slowly starts to fade out and change, and it becomes eerie, and the camera zooms in on their smiling faces and then slowly fades to black to the eerie music, setting the scene for, setting the tone for the next scene, which is Genesis 3. This chapter sets the plot of the entire Bible. We are introduced to humanity's antagonist. Choice, really, in a sense. I mean, it was introduced in chapter 2, and Toby even talked about choice last week, but now we see where it leads. And of course, Satan is a villain and antagonist, and sin is the problem. But in a way, when you think about it, the real antagonist is kind of choice. And I don't say that to, I mean, it's, it's the same thing that allowed Satan to fall in the first place, right? And maybe antagonist isn't the right word, but it's hard to come up with the right word because, you know, choice isn't bad. It's right because it's given to us by God. Yet it's also where the tension lies. There was choice in Genesis 2 and everything was good. But then we see that with choice in Genesis 3, everything becomes not so good as sin enters the world. And next week, we're actually going to 
finish the whole chap the rest of the chapter of Genesis 3 as we look at the effects of sin entering the world but this week we're just focused on the first 6 verses as we see how it got here in the first place and and people would call this passage of scripture the fall it's Genesis 3 1 through 6 let's see what it says ready Brian <laughs> and just so you guys know, the reason that I'm wearing a t-shirt and tennis shoes this morning is because all my dress clothes are still at the old house. <clears throat> all right, here we go. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden the woman said to the serpent we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden god said you must not eat it or touch it or you will die no you will certainly not die the serpent said to the woman in fact god knows that when you eat it your eyes will be opened and you will be like god knowing good and evil the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Let's pray. God, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Lord, thank you for each and every individual who is here to hear the word of God, to study it, to let it transform their lives. We know that it is not by chance that we have gathered together this morning. We know that it's not by chance that this is the passage that we are studying. Lord, you have something for every one of us. Every time we open the word of God, you have something to teach us, to transform our minds that we need to use to transform our lives. We pray that you would show that Show us what that is for us this morning. As a group, as a church, and also as individuals, as families, couples. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be open to your word. We pray these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Now, when it comes to sin... We often have more questions than we have answers, don't we? And I think that by the end of today, that will still be the case. <laughs> but I hope to provide as many answers as the Bible provides for us. When we do study Scripture, though, sometimes we have to realize that God just doesn't give us all the answers that we look for. But He does give us all that we need. There, but there is no way to study this without faith. There remains mysterious element to all of it. And that's okay. But the questions start immediately, right? Well, if everything is good, then what's up with this serpent? And why is this serpent speaking? Was this the, were they surprised that this serpent was speaking? Was it the first time? Was it just a serpent or was it something more? And I don't have all the answers to all of the questions. Was, were they surprised that this serpent was speaking? I don't know. I don't know. Was it the first time an animal has spoken to them? I don't really know. Balaam's donkey spoke to him, so it's not the only time we've seen that in Scripture. But one answer I do have, though, is that this was not simply an animal. Revelation 12, 9, I believe, reveals what most of us assume when we read the passage, even though it's not explicitly stated. It says, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So in Revelation and throughout Scripture, we have Satan described as this ancient serpent who leads the world astray. And I don't think there's any doubt that this serpent was Satan. Satan is here in this perfect world, but it doesn't seem perfect with him in it, does it? 
How is Satan there? I don't know for sure. He can't create things, so I know that he didn't create a serpent. So he must be either possessing it or, you know, uh, appearing as a serpent or somehow tricking Adam and Eve into thinking that he was a serpent. I don't know exactly how, but that's probably not the question that bugs us as much as why. Why was he there? We know why he wanted to be there, but why did God let him be there? To that question, I will probably not be able to give you a satisfying answer. Unless you're satisfied with trusting that it was a good God's good plan. What else can I do? What else could I give you? We could spend the rest of our lives studying and theorizing and philosophizing about it, but at some point there will come a time when you have to trust in God's goodness and His love. And for some mysterious to us reason, God loved us enough to let Satan in the garden. Which is the first blank if you're following along with the notes in your bulletin. And God loved us enough to give us the choice in the first place, which Toby talked about last week, because maybe true love and worship are not truly love and worship if they're forced. If God hadn't made one rule to not eat of that one tree and we never had the choice to obey him or not, then we would really just be fleshy robots, not humans. According to God's good design, inherent to being a human is to have choice. And with that choice and God's plan, our relationship with him, our our eternity and our experience with God are better for it, even if we don't always understand why. God loved us enough to choose to create us, and he loved us enough to choose to let us choose to love and worship him. Now, I could play devil's advocate with myself and say, well, then why won't we have the choice to sin in heaven? Does that mean that we will no longer be human? And I would tell myself, that's a good question. You're a very good arguer, self. (laughs) But being with God in sinless perfection, without our own evil natures and desires, and, and without Satan's enticement for us to sin in heaven for eternity, is our choice. God is not taking me to heaven against my will. I am choosing that. I say, yes, God, please Come, take me out of this. Remove sin from my life. Remove it for eternity. I don't want it anymore. I want it gone forever. And so in heaven, God is not going to rid me of my choice. He's going to honor my choice. Hallelujah. But let's get more into what was happening here in this passage. Satan started talking to Eve. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Now, this reminds me of when we tell our kids something like, no more cartoons. And then one of them runs to their siblings and says, Daddy said we can never watch cartoons again. (laughs) But you see what Satan's doing. He's starting to plant these seeds of doubt into Eve's mind. And he wants to cause her to imagine God as being more severe. He wants her to start doubting and questioning God's word, which is exactly what he wants us to do today because doubt is foundational to sin. Doubting God's word is foundational to sin. No matter what sin we have, we can find some element of not trusting God. Sin would not be a problem for us if we trusted God with 100% of our being 100% of the time. But we don't. And so sin's a problem for all of us. Now, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Right then, right then and there, Satan, or Adam and Eve, straight away should have just cut off the conversation because it smells. It smells right from the start. Right? Like the serpent is, is, is suggesting something that they know is false and it's about their creator. But they didn't. They proceed with the conversation like a married man who proceeds with the conversation with a woman who asks, does your... Does your wife really satisfy you? The correct answer is not, well, I mean, I think so. Why do you ask? 
The correct answer is, yes, she satisfies me, she devil, and then you run away. <laughs> Joseph didn't sit around chatting with Potiphar's wife. He ran away. And that's what we need to do when Satan starts trying to plant seeds of doubt in our minds. Yet, for some weird reason, in American Christian culture, there's a thing happening connected with the deconstruction process, if you've heard of that. People are losing their faith in God, and lots of professing believers are actually encouraging people to walk down these paths of doubt and just to explore it and, and to go there and follow those thoughts. And I want to be fair because I think I understand the heart of where people are coming from. It's true that we, if we have doubts, and we do, doubt is a common experience, so don't feel like you're unique if you ever have doubts. But when we have doubts, we shouldn't pretend like they don't exist. We shouldn't just act like everything's okay and, and, and be, I don't know, just ignore it. But we also shouldn't fall into Satan's scheme and the advice that I'm seeing in some Christian circles today, if applied to Adam and Eve, would look like, well, well, you know, this serpent, he, he, he does make some good points. And, you know, you should probably just explore what he's saying and, and figure out what you, what you believe for yourself. And we trust that God's going to get you where he wants you to be. That's insane. That's lunacy. When doubt creeps into our lives, we need to run to God, not from him. Run to God. Run to God's word. Run to God's people, the people who will help strengthen your faith. Adam and Eve should have just reminded each other right then and there, hey, you, you remember what God said? I remember what God said. Of course, he, Adam should have stepped up as a leader anyway. We're going to talk about that later. But they should have just cut that conversation off from the start. But they didn't. So it continues. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. You notice what she did there? She added to God's word. She's continuing the conversation and in so doing, now she's starting to twist things. God didn't say they couldn't touch the tree. He said they couldn't eat the fruit. You can almost see the wheels start turning in Eve's head. Instead of trusting God's goodness and the goodness of this one rule, now she's starting to change God's character in her mind. She's adding a severity that wasn't there. Now it's two rules. Don't eat, don't touch. And I was talking with another believer recently about his experience at two different churches and he was moving from one church to another, and one church that he had been attending, he described as being very legalistic. They made up a bunch of rules about things that people weren't supposed to do that the Bible didn't give them. And he was beginning to attend this other church, and he met with the pastor and sat down, and he asked the pastor, he's like, so what's the difference between that church and, and, and this church? And the pastor said, well, they believe that everything is wrong unless God says it's right. And we believe that everything is right unless God says it's wrong. And I thought, that's a pretty good perspective of the situation. And, and the gentleman sharing that with me said, when, he, when the pastor described it that way, he, he said if, how freeing it felt to think of things that way instead of loading yourselves with unnecessary burdens that God doesn't load you down with. Because when we do that, what happens is it starts to alter our perception of God. And we change his character in our minds. And that's exactly what was happening with Eve. And this is, of course, all leading to her eventual denial of God's goodness and authority altogether because she decides, well, God hasn't done a very good job of making up the rules in my life, so I'm going to make them for myself. That's not right. Oh, yeah. Questioning God's character. That was number three. But verse four says, no, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. And Satan comes along doing what he does best, half truths, yet full lies at the same time. That's spiritual math. It's 50% true and 100% false. If, I know God never changes, but Satan, he's pretty consistent too, right? He's doing the same old song and dance that he's always done. Telling people things that are partially true and 100% evil. 
Jesus was a good teacher, say atheists. Jesus was a prophet, say Muslims. Yeah, he absolutely was, but you know what? He was God. Well, Satan can roll with that one too. Well, sure, Jesus was a God, the God of this world, say Mormons. And Satan will even appeal to God's goodness with his half-truths. Well, sin is, sin is okay because God will forgive you. He didn't even need to do that with Adam and Eve, but you can imagine how the conversation could have gone. Well, God, did, God didn't say you couldn't lick it. Why don't you just bite it, swish it around, spit it out? Or surely, if you eat the fruit, God's going to forgive you. Goodness, doesn't he love you? He, God loves you. He's going to forgive you. No. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Again, with the half-truth, he's right. They will know evil. That's exactly what he wants. In that situation in the garden, everything was good for Adam and Eve. They had complete freedom to enjoy God's creation except one thing. One rule that God gave them to protect them from knowing evil. That was the point. It's interesting to think of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They already had knowledge of good. They were living in it. They were experiencing it every day. But disobeying God would open them up, not just to the knowledge of good, but the knowledge of evil. Because they would do evil. And then they would know evil. And I don't have much interest in theorizing about the tree itself. I think more than anything, it represented our choice. You know, was there something special about the tree? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe God could have just chosen any of the trees in the garden at random. I mean, think about it. If he just picked some random tree and said, don't eat that one, but then they did it, they would be doing evil and they would be opened up to the knowledge, not just of good, but of evil. Of course, God's desire is that they would only know good, but he also desired that they would choose to only know good. Therefore, they needed some rule that they could disobey, and he gave them one, and if they had obeyed it, they would have been protected from ever knowing evil. But instead, look what Satan does. He comes along, and he presents knowing evil as a good thing. The same thing that he does today. He tried to get Adam... Eve to question God's goodness by planting these thoughts in her head that she's actually, hey, you're being deprived of something good. What is it? Well, it's this fruit. What else is it? It's knowing evil. It's crazy. But in reality, we know she wasn't being deprived of anything good. She was only being deprived of evil. But she fell for evil's allure. Which is, again, the same thing that Satan does with us today, the same thing that we fall for when we walk toward and into sin, we convince ourselves so often that we are being deprived of something good. We can develop this animosity towards God's commands in our lives, thinking, well, God's, he's just keeping us from having fun. You know, he's trying to rob me of this pleasure, of this power, of this money that I want. And we fall into the same trap of not trusting him, not trusting that actually his rules are only depriving us of harm, harm beyond our imagination. But Satan comes along and presents another path, a path that apparently they hadn't really considered very much yet. We know that they already had the choice to disobey God or not, but for God's good plan, it was necessary to allow Satan in to entice them with that choice. And I don't know exactly why, but I do know that it gave Adam and Eve a chance to prove their love to God. It makes me think about if a man and a woman were thinking, you know, they thought that they're the last people on earth, and the man decides, well, he decides to marry the woman because, well, she's the woman. And so they get married, and then they're living their life, and then they discover they're not the last people on earth. They find another woman, a woman that the man's attracted to, and a woman who tries to lure the man away from his wife, and that is when his love and his loyalty to his wife really gets tested. It's when the enticement comes. So the option to disobey was already there, but apparently it hadn't really crossed their minds yet. So Satan came along to help that process along. Just like any one of us. It made me think about my kids. They have uh, quiet time in the afternoons. It used to be nap time 
Eve still naps, but Judah and Emery are just supposed to play quietly in their rooms, and sometimes they go into the guest room to play during quiet time, and the guest room has a TV in it, and they are perfectly capable physically of turning that TV on and watching something they know they're not supposed to watch anything, but they could do it. Now, that hasn't happened yet. And I keep waiting for the day that I'm going to walk in and catch them trying to watch something during quiet time. And I would like to think, you know, like, oh, they're just, they're just so committed to making good choices. But part of me in the back of my head thinks, I, you know, I'm just not sure if the thoughts ever really crossed their minds yet. <laughs> maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. But if someone else, if a third party, too, came in and, and started enticing them with that other option wouldn't surprise me at all if they gave in to it. And that's what Satan does. He comes in and he presents another path to us that we hadn't thought yet. He doesn't need to embody a serpent anymore. He can just use us. We do it with each other. You see it in kids' lives. That kids will come along and tell other kids, here's how you can get the things that you want. Here's how you can get more TV. Here's how you can get candy. And as often as happened with Eve, Satan steps in to convince us that we should want something that we didn't even want before. Adam and Eve didn't really desire the fruit from this tree before this conversation. It doesn't seem. They knew it was there, but the thing is, they were perfectly content in the abundance of God's goodness that he had given them. But Satan comes along and convinces them, no, actually, you should want this, you know. Have you really thought about it? It's the same thing I do when I'm talking to friends that haven't been on a cruise yet. Leslie and I have done several cruises in our lives. It's our favorite way to vacation. Now, unfortunately, in the Pacific Northwest, it's way more expensive to cruise from here, so we haven't done that since we moved to Oregon. But when I meet friends that haven't cruised and we're talking about vacations, I always like to tell them uh, how much we like cruising and, and why it you know, just explain to them because it's, and it's not like they didn't, it's not like cruises weren't ever available to them before that conversation, but I'm coming along to be like, Hey, no, have you actually thought about this? It's really appealing. Here's, here's all the reasons why you should want this. And then you can start wanting something that you didn't want before, which is the same thing that happens whenever we're tempted to sin so often. If we're attuned to our sinfulness, we know that there's always some sin out there that we haven't done yet, something that hasn't crossed our minds yet. But it's waiting, and Satan's waiting for the opportunity to entice us. We might be going right along with life without this particular sin because we haven't thought about it too much, but then something comes along and it presents itself in a new way, and we find ourselves being more appealed. And that seed starts to germinate. And we find ourselves thinking more and more about that thing that we want or, or that thing that we would like to do. And before you know it, sin's allure feels so powerful that we convince ourselves the only way to stop the temptation is just to give in to it. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And so they gave in. They took that other path that was presented to them, the one that leads away from God. It was this whole process of doubting God's word, adding to God's word, questioning his character, falling for the allure of evil, and ultimately deciding, I'm going to remove God from the throne and replace him with self. Which was a logical step for Eve to take because of the way that Satan approached her in this situation. See, his goal was to get Eve to put herself in God's position, but first... He got her to put herself in Adam's position. Because Adam was the leader. He was the one that God designed to be the head of the family, but Satan went to Eve. And they both went along with it. Adam sat and watched passively, not stepping up to be the leader, and Eve actively allowed the serpent to put her in that position as she fell for his deception and then led her husband into 
the same sin. In the outline, I know that I listed the first mistake as doubting God's word, but really, chronologically, it seems like the first mistake in the story was neglecting God's designated roles for leadership. The very beginning of sin in the world included a reversal of God's ordained roles of headship, which is an important point that we're actually going to come back to next week as we look at the effects of sin on the world, because one of the effects of the fall is this continual, never-ending battle of the sexes for who leads the home and the church. And another effect is our sinful nature, which according to scripture is passed on through Adam and not Eve. And when we look at how sin entered this world, it's easy to see how our enemy is still working the same schemes today comes in. He hasn't changed. We keep falling for it. Well, don't, if it's not broken, don't fix it. We keep falling for it. We doubt God's word. We add to it. We question his character. We fall for the allure of sin. We believe that God is depriving us of something good. We start wanting things that we never wanted before, and we fall into sin, even still by neglecting God's design for leadership. But ultimately, I think it seems like it all boils down and comes back to one root characteristic. And that is pride. I think John summed it up very well in 1 John 2.16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. You can see what he's saying there is the same thing that we see in Genesis 3. Same thing that we're still going through today. You can see how Eve went through that process. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. The same thing that caused Satan to fall. The same thing that caught Eve. And the same thing that gets us today. Pride truly does come before the fall. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. May it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. May we hide your word in our hearts that we may not sin against you. Lord, I know that sometimes we don't understand why you do everything that you do why your plan included, included some of these things that we just can't grasp, but it, we know we have to trust that it's good because you are good. You are nothing but good. Our perspective, Lord, it changes everything. So, so often we look at the world and we think, how could God allow all of this bad stuff to happen, but if we look at it the right way, we would see the world and say, how would God allow any of us to live ever? Because we don't deserve it. But you are gracious, you are kind, you are long-suffering. And even when Adam and Eve, you had one rule And we look back at it and we think to ourselves, oh, they were so dumb. They were so stupid. Why would they do that? But if we were in that position, I'm sure we would have done the same thing. Because again, it's easy for us to get proud. It's easy for us to look at other people and say, I would have never done that. It's pride. But God, we need to humble ourselves and we need to just say, God, I'm not worthy. I just need forgiveness. I just need grace. I just need mercy. And that is what we are here for. That is why Christ came, Lord, even from Genesis 3 on. You didn't leave us alone. You had a plan. And Christ was humble enough to come down here and fulfill that plan to die on the cross for our sins. And we pray that everyone here this morning would know him with all of their heart. That they would understand and have the the redemption, the forgiveness of sins.
God, this world is fallen, it is broken, and it started a long, long time ago. And we've been wallowing in it ever since. But you have been working step by step by step. Lord, we're talking about the bad news. And we need to understand this bad news to understand the good news. The good news that it's not the end of the story. The good news that we are not without hope. But you have sent Christ. And he died and he rose again. And he sits at your right hand interceding for us. And to those who repent and put their faith in you, Lord, you promise to seal them with the Holy Spirit and to guarantee eternity with no more sin. And so I pray that anyone who needs that this morning would come to you. That they wouldn't delay, that they wouldn't question that you would ease their doubts, give them courage. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And we pray this all in Christ's holy name. Amen.